Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hail the heavenly Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that men no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Come, desire of nations, come, fix in us thy humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed, bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness, Lord of face, stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Church, those are remarkable lyrics penned with rich theology that remind us of incredible, of incredible truths that point us to the incarnation. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, the son of, Me of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. You see, when God took on flesh, he entered into the world that he himself created and sustained. Imagine with me for a moment the author of the story writing himself into the story in order that he might save the villains of the story. You see, God came to us when we in our own strength could not get to God. That is the story of Christmas. And today we take a break from our book study in the book of Mark to look at the birth announcement of Jesus to Joseph. And the title of the sermon this morning for those of you who are taking notes is God with us. And the passage is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And the sermon in a sentence this morning, if you get nothing else, hear this. Jesus became like us so that he might save us from our sin. Jesus became like us that he might save us from our sin. My prayer today is that we would see the birth of Jesus is more than just a baby in a manger, more than just Jesus surrounded by a nativity scene, but that we would see the birth of Jesus as it really is, as a divine rescue mission, as God in flesh who has come to save us from our sin. And so let's take just a brief moment. Let's set up the context of the book of Matthew. Matthew penned these words. He was writing to a largely Jewish audience. And in the previous passage, in the lineage passage, the verses 1 through 17, we read a lot of names. But I would encourage you at some point in time today or tomorrow to go back and to read that lineage and to read those names. Because every name in that lineage points us to a person. It points us to a story that was ultimately at some point in time engulfed by the story of the gospel is all of these people in the Old Testament pointed us to a Savior who was to come. It's a reminder that God takes sinful people and he uses them in his perfect plan. And now we're gonna pick up in verse 18 of chapter one. And if you are physically able this morning, I invite you to stand with me one last time in honor of and in reverence to the reading of God's inerrant life-giving word. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, 
being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, and God, I thank you for the day. I thank you for the gathering of the church on this day. God, I thank you for the word, and I pray that you would use the truths found inside of the scriptures today, God, to bring about rejoicing in our hearts. God, as we reflect on the, the wonder of the incarnation, God, I pray that those that have come through the doors today that are unbelievers, God, I pray for their souls. I pray that today you would convict, and God, that you would draw them to yourself. I pray that the gospel would pierce their heart. God, that you would reveal the emptiness of a life lived apart from Christ, and I pray that they would be saved today. God, I pray that you would work through this sermon. God, that you would hide me behind the message of the gospel. And God, I pray that your word would go forth with power and with conviction. God, we love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I admit to you on the front end of, of uh, this sermon that my voice is nearly gone. And so I'm going to try my best to get through this in a normal tone, although I'm already having to speak louder just so I can pronounce what I'm trying to say. But I want to give you four observations from this text for you to take note of today. Number one, the first observation we're going to see in this text is the fundamental nature of the virgin birth. I want you to see the fundamental nature of the virgin birth. Go back to the text and look with me again at what it says in verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And so the, the Hebrew marriage involved two stages. There's some context here. It involved two stages. It involved the betrothal stage and then the actual marriage ceremony. So there was an engagement and then a time of, of, of maintaining purity up until the the, the wedding vows were exchanged, uh, you know, very similar to what we have in our culture today with engagement and then marriage. That's how this was set up. However, different than in our culture, the marriage was arranged by the families, often without even consulting with the bride and groom. I would also note that arranged marriages and countries that have arranged marriages have much lower divorce rate than we do in ours. Uh, so we may think that's crazy. I think they think the same thing of us. And so these families would come together and a contract would be made up. A payment from the groom's family would be given to the bride's family. I suppose if she was a, a very attractive woman, I mean, you're talking goats, you're talking cattle, you're talking sheep, you're talking very, very, you know, uh, nice animals. And maybe if she was high maintenance or something along those lines, maybe some chickens and some pigeons. I don't know. I don't know how this worked. But I know the contract was considered binding as soon as it was made. In other words, as soon as the family came together and they made the contract and gifts were exchanged or payment was exchanged, the man and the woman were considered legally married, even though the marriage ceremony and the consummation of the marriage had, had not taken place until sometime later after the agreement had been agreed upon. And the betrothal time then served as a time of probation and a time of testing fidelity to see if the man and the woman could remain true to the covenant they, that, that they were about to make. And the text says, before they came together, I want you to underline that phrase there, before they came together, she was found to be with child. That is emphasizing that Joseph and Mary had no physical relations whatsoever, yet Mary was found to be with child. 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 Child.
Intimacy was not known between them, and yet she was pregnant with a baby. That is the wonder of the incarnation, the virgin birth, and it's astounding. There is no explanation other than the one that Joseph immediately, immediately went to in his mind as to why Mary could be pregnant. And so Joseph was heartbroken in this moment. I mean, you can imagine the scene. Here's this young man who is betrothed to be married to this girl, a woman he thinks is is virtuous, a woman who thinks is marriage material, only to find out that he has not been with her, but yet she was pregnant. But the text doesn't say that she was found to be with child and then stop. It adds that she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, showing us the unique nature of Jesus' birth. Church, in order to save us from our sin, Jesus had to be free from sin. Matthew here is making it clear that Jesus' birth was different from that of any other Jewish boy named in the genealogy before this. Jesus was born of an earthly mother without the need of an earthly father. This is the virgin birth. And this is the reason why it is significant. If Jesus was conceived like any other baby, then he could not be God because Jesus had no beginning. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that through him all things were created. Jesus has always existed from eternity past. And then in Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve sin in the garden. And as a result of that, sin is passed down to every person after that. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. He says, for as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then in Romans 5, again, Paul writing to the church that spread throughout Rome. Beginning in verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, so sin came through Adam, and death through sin. Listen, we need to get away from this idea that sin makes us bad or that sin makes us immoral. Sin makes you spiritually dead. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But Paul goes on to say this, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. Church, through Adam's sin in the garden, sin was passed down to every single person. You do not have to teach an infant to sin. They do it naturally. I, when I was in college, somebody asked the question, are you a sin because, or do you sin because you're a sinner or are you a sinner because you sin? And the answer to that question is this. Yes, it's both. We sin because it is in our very nature to sin. It's who we are. We seek to please ourselves. We've inherited that nature. This is why the virgin birth is so important because Jesus was not born with the same sin nature that you and I have. The virgin birth is essential then because through it, Jesus was born free from sin and he was born free from the bondage of sin. Several years ago, a very popular preacher made the statement that the virgin birth is not essential to the Christian faith. That you can be a Christian and you do not have to believe in the virgin birth. And he's backing up and he's trying to be you know, very scholarly in in this moment. But what he's failing to see is that if you can't believe in the virgin birth, you're really gonna have a difficult time believing in the substitutionary death and ensuing resurrection. All of it is essential. And then I wanna highlight something very practical. Look at verse 19. And her husband Joseph, 
being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. In other words, Joseph did not want to publicly shame her. Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph wanted to put her aside quietly and end this engagement period that they had. Joseph intended to maintain his personal righteousness by showing compassion to Mary, even though it appeared that she was an adulteress. This goes against our very nature. Most of the time when we're sinned against, we want to publicly shame the person who has sinned against us. And Joseph doesn't do that within our story. And that leads us to the second observation from this text that we see. And I want you to see the redemptive plan of the incarnation. Look at verse 21 at what it says. Or back up to verse 20. But as he considered these things, so while he's thinking about putting her aside and ending the engagement, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. That is the redemptive plan in the incarnation. Church, we celebrate the Christmas season and we remember that Jesus was born, but we must never forget the connection to Easter, that Jesus was born in order that he might die. That's why he was born. The name Jesus literally means Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah will save. The name wasn't uncommon among Jewish men. But what separated Jesus from all of the other Jewish boys and Jewish men running around Jerusalem at the time is that they pointed to a coming Messiah while Jesus is the coming Messiah. He is the Messiah who would come. John MacArthur said it this way. He said, all other men who had those names testified by their names to the Lord's salvation. But this one who would be born to Mary not only would testify of God's salvation, but would himself be that salvation. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. Jesus came, and he came to save his people from their sin. I love when we do baptism at East Point and we have children getting baptized. Because every time a parent comes up to me and says, my child has made a profession of faith. They come into my office a week or few days or a week and a half or so before baptism service. And I asked children the same questions. What is sin? Sin is anything we say, do, or think that goes against God and his word. Okay, so, so sin goes against God. What does sin do? Sin separates us from God. Sin brings a separation between us and God. Well, how then can one be reconciled and brought back to God? Who does that for us? Well, Jesus does that. How does Jesus do that? He does it through his death on the cross when he takes on our sins. He deals with the issue of sin and then he reconciles us back to God. Listen, we've all sinned against God, choosing ourselves over him time and again. We have all rejected him and his love for us repeatedly. We fill our lives with idols over and over again. Idols that will never satisfy the human heart. Even as believers, we run from one, run from one thing to another thing to another thing in hopes that that thing is going to satisfy us, and it never does. And yet in the midst of all of that, there is a God who left the throne room of heaven he wrapped himself in flesh. He entered into the womb of a woman and was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died a sinner's death. And he did all of that in pursuit of your heart and in pursuit of your soul. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What that means is that we don't clean ourselves up in order to come to Christ. 
Christ came to us in order to save us and then clean us up. Church, before God ever uttered the words, let there be light, there was a rescue mission in place. That rescue mission included all who would be redeemed. Jesus left the throne temporarily in order to redeem a people who would one day gather around that same throne and worship him for all of eternity. And all throughout history, there have been attempts to throw off the plan that God has set in place, this redemption plan. Because in Genesis 3.15, the promise was made. Adam and Eve sinned. Sin's going to be passed down to everybody. Death is going to be passed down to everybody. But in Genesis 3.15, we have the proto-evangelium. That is the, the, the first gospel where the promise is made that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And when you read the rest of the Old Testament in light of that promise, what you're going to see is the forces of darkness and the enemy trying to destroy that plan. I mean, even in the Gospel of Matthew, you see King Herod, as he sees a threat to the throne, he kills all the children in the area so that Jesus and his family had to flee to Egypt because the forces of darkness were trying to destroy the seed that was going to crush their head. And yet every attempt failed as the redemptive plan of God marched on. And that leads us to the third observation that we see in this text. I want you to see the realization of specific prophecy. Look at verse 22 with me. It says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, Jesus didn't come just to fulfill a few of the Old Testament prophecies. He didn't come to loosely connect with them. He fulfilled them perfectly. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. So when you read of the census being taken and how Mary and Joseph were making their way back to the town of Bethlehem, you can see the providence of God over that story. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says he was going to be born of a virgin. In Psalm 22, 7, it says he was going to be mocked during his death. In Psalm twenty-two fifteen, 15, it says that he would be condemned with criminals. In Isaiah 53, there's a lot there, but I'm going to give you one line. It says that he would remain silent before his accusers. In Psalm twenty-two sixteen, 16, it said that he would be pierced both hands and feet. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says that the government will rest on his shoulders and that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Church, the Bible is not a random collection of stories put together by several different authors in an attempt to, to manipulate people throughout history. The Bible has one author as God spoke to men. And there's one hero and there's one story and it all points us to Jesus who is the hero of our faith. That's who we celebrate. That's why we're here today. It's to look to him. Bodhi Bauckham said it this way, many writings and or teachings contain truth to some degree. The Bible is set apart, however, in that it does not merely contain truth. It is truth, complete, without any mixture of error. From Genesis through Revelation, God executed the plan perfectly. I remember I was telling some, uh, some of our um, young adults who were over the house hanging out the other day um, about me and Austin, our story, how we met. I met Austin, and within four weeks, I told Austin, hey, listen, I don't want to freak you out or anything, but you and I, we're going to get married. I was 22. She was 19 at the time. And shockingly, sitting in my parents' driveway in the car, she said, I think so too. She was in. Four weeks in, and, and, and I had her. Okay, greatest accomplishment of my life. So 
Then it was just a matter of the proposal. You gotta plan out the proposal. Listen, I planned this thing out perfectly, all right? My father owns 200 acres, and it stretches from Scotland Road all the way to Beartail Creek Canal. He owns the canal, or the part that goes to the back of his place. That was where I took Austin on one of our second or third date before she met my family. Uh, we went down there to the, to the creek, and I told my little brother, I said, listen, I've got a table, I've got a tablecloth, I've got candles, I've got roses, and I had a Bible, because every preacher has to propose with the Bible, right? It makes it seem more spiritual. So he took the ring and all this stuff, and he went, and he set it up. Now, it's supposed to rain. It did rain that morning. It was overcast. It was cloudy. The only way to get down to the bottom then because of the rain, boy, it wasn't going to happen um, uh, through my car because I drove a car at the time and lived on a farm. Don't ask me why. I just did. And so I had my brother's four-wheeler set up outside. And I said, hey, why don't you climb on the four-wheeler? And I also said, this is where things really started getting sticky. She said, no. I said, no, I want to go show you something. She said, I'm not climbing on the four-wheeler. And my sister-in-law, thank goodness she was there. She was like, get on the four-wheeler. So she gets on the four-wheeler. I drive her to the bottom. We go to the creek where my little brother has set up everything perfectly, except that he had candles that he didn't even light. The plan was completely thrown off. Nothing worked the way it was supposed to work. Now, at the end of the day, she said yes, 16 years in another week and a half. You know, it, that part's all history, but nothing worked the way I thought it would. Church planting over the last 12 years, I can't tell you the number of times we walked into that middle school band hall, there was water leaks, no heat, no air conditioning. We walk in and we had an alarm beeping one day at the front of the school where you walked in through the foyer. I took a, a pillow from the teacher's lounge and I held it up while Josh duct taped it to muffle the sound, right? Nothing ever goes as planned, at least not in my life. But when we read this story, that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet, we see that Jesus fulfilled the plan of God perfectly. Nothing was done that wasn't supposed to be done that God didn't allow to happen. He set this plan in motion before the foundation of the world and he carried it out to perfection through Christ. The practical side of this observation is that the Bible is trustworthy and the Bible should be cherished by believers because we read it knowing that it points us to Christ. And that leads to the fourth observation that we find in the text. I want you to see the heart of the Christmas story. Go back to the text. Look with me at verses 23. Or or verse 23. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Church, when we could not get to him, when man in their own strength tried everything in their power, to get to God. When the builders of the Tower of Babel tried to build a tower to get to the heavens. When man made up religion after religion after religion trying to get to God. God himself left the glories of heaven. He entered into the womb of a woman and he was born with flesh wrapped around him in order that he might die a sinner's death to save you and me from our sin. We look at all other religions of the world. There's always an attempt to do all these things in order to be made right with God. I've heard, I think it was David Platt that described it this way, that all religions essentially view themselves as going up the mountain. And they'll look at other religions saying, well, they're just getting to God a different way or a different side of the mountain. And they believe Christianity to be the same way. But the hope of the gospel this morning is not that you and I are trying to get up that mountain in our own strength. The hope of the gospel is that Jesus came down that mountain. 
He lived a life you couldn't live and I couldn't live. And he died a death that we were supposed to die so that he could carry us back up that mountain with him. That's the message of the gospel. Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us. In John 1.14, John MacArthur said, it's the greatest verse in all the Bible. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to reconcile us back to God. Jesus came to be with his disciples, to be with believers And the promise at the end of Matthew 28, behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, that promise is still with us today, as Jesus is always with us. So in closing this morning, I want to give you three points of application. Number one, I want to encourage you to consistently reflect on the extent God went to save you from your sin. Reflect on the extent that he went to save you from your sin. It's not just a child in a manger. It's God wrapped in flesh. It's a temporary leaving of the throne to come to rescue us from our sin. Number two, treasure the word of God in your life and read it daily to see Jesus as the hero of our faith. I want you to know there is nothing more nourishing to my soul on a daily basis than the Word of God. It is balm for a wearied soul. It is is encouragement when I am discouraged. It 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 is life for a believer. And so read it. And number three, I want to encourage you to walk in fellowship with God the Father because of the work of God the Son. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For the righteous died for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Yes, sin separated us, but Jesus brings reconciliation. And as a result of that, you and I can live in fellowship with God the Father every single day. We can enjoy the benefits of being a son of God every single day. In closing, I want to direct your attention back to the lineage of Jesus. Back to the lineage of Jesus. Look at verse 5. It says, In Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And if you read through this lineage, you're going to read about a lot of different types of characters. The most unlikely characters from prostitutes to sinners. Their stories are full of sin and failure. But in a lot of ways, their stories are similar to our stories. You see, Jesus did not come to collect the righteous. The Bible says there is none who are righteous. No, not one. Jesus came to save the sinner. And so if your past or maybe even your present is riddled with failure and conflict, brokenness and rejection, I want you to know that you can find peace today and you can find it in the arms of Jesus. If you've never trusted in Christ and you've never repented of sin, we're gonna have an invitation. That is an opportunity for you to come. This morning, I've got a good friend from my former church who texts me every Sunday morning. He says, you've been prayed for today. What should I pray specifically for? And I responded that that visitors who attend church a couple of times a year would have their hearts pierced by the gospel. So if you're here and you've never trusted in Christ and you've never repented of sin and God is working in your heart, we're gonna have an opportunity for you to come and to give your life to Jesus. You come to me, I will pray with you. There are men and women all over this room who would love to take you to my office with an open Bible and show you what it means to repent and believe. And if you're a believer this morning, 
as we sing and as we worship and as we reflect on the preaching of the word, let us rejoice together in the work that Jesus has done. Again, the C.S. Lewis quote says, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. We've been brought into the family. Let us rejoice as such. I'm gonna pray and give you an opportunity to respond. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the opportunity to stand and preach it week in and week out. I pray now that, God, you would use it in the hearts of believers. God, to stir our affections, to deepen our commitments to Christ. Father, I pray for the unbelievers in the room. I pray that, God, you would, that you would bring conviction. God, as they search for peace, I pray that they would find peace only in Christ. So God, move during this time. We love and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand with me.